welcome to Points of View, a discussion of issues regarding persons with disabilities, moderated by Doug Uziak. Today's panelists are A.J. Bray, writer, model, actor. Todd Varwick, Director of Public Policy, Western New York Independent Living Incorporated. And Jim Moody, Director of Independent Living, Genesee Region. Welcome. Today we're going to talk about how the media portrays persons with disabilities. And I suspect when we talk about the media, we're talking about the print media, the electronic media, the broadcast media, and et cetera. So uh, let's start with you, Todd. What's your perspective on what you're seeing? How, well, the broadcast media. How's the broadcast media portraying people with disabilities? Well, when you're talking about broadcast media, we, you know, we talk about you know, what it is we watch on TV, but far more likely we talk about what it is that we see uh, on news programs and how they portray you know, people with disabilities with real lives. I think we're struggling with that. One of the things with the media portrayal is that we're stuck in the media system is stuck putting us in paths of portrayal. You know, we can either be inspiring, we can be dangerous, or we can be objects to be pitied. And I don't think we've actually found a really good way to move beyond those models. Well, you know, I, I'd like maybe to concentrate a little bit on that whole aspect of, the, the, say, the news media, Angela. You, you know, you're an actor, you've been involved, you do writing yourself. I mean, what are you seeing either from your peers out there as how they're portraying people with disabilities or maybe what you're doing as a person with a disability? Well, personally, I try to cover the aspects that are relevant to our culture, to the disability community. Um, obviously avoiding things like the obvious inspirational stories, the obvious, you know, things like Britain's top missing model, things like that, and get into what really makes our culture tick as a whole and what we really need from the inside out, which is being largely ignored. Um, it's, it's starting to be seen in things like adaptive fashion, which I've been covering more and more of lately. Uh, and it's very fortunate there are designers out there who are seeing the different needs, and yes, probably cashing in on it, but on the other hand, it is giving us a product that we can utilize. So I'm trying to cover that, whereas the mainstream media is covering the inspirational side of it. And yes, a model like myself would be used in that aspect and in that capacity. Jim, as an advocate, you know, running an organization for people with disabilities, what are you seeing as how the uh, news media is dealing with people with disabilities? Generally, it's pretty good. Uh, we have had some challenges because we are one of only a few organizations in our area that actually uh, work with people with disabilities. And because of that, uh, we get overshadowed by a number of different organizations and um, requirements or special events of the day in the local community. Now, T Todd, you know, you've been involved in this network for God knows how many years. You know, it goes back probably to the Flintstones. <laughs> but, you know, when, when we're talking about the news media and people with disabilities, especially now when, you know, with, with all the state and the fiscal ramifications, I mean, are we not seeing many times that people with disabilities are the scapegoat on this dollar sign? Sometimes. I mean, we were, we've gone through a definitely immediate exposure in terms of Medicaid expenditures, you know, here in New York. 25% um, of the Medicaid expenditures are paid for by taxpayers. That gets taxpayers riled up, and people being riled up is a, is a common item for news crews. The problem with that is that we don't necessarily always tell both sides of the story. Uh, the, the common media item, if it bleeds, it leads, applies to us too. That's one of the problems. When we're actually trying to communicate issues about how money could be smarter spent, about why things could be in a different way than they are, and how the media is instead stuck on trying to put me into one of those three boxes. Am I something to be admired? Am I something to be pitied? Or am I something to be feared? So, you know, in New York State, there's been a, a lot of media talk about the, this whole situ situation with persons with developmental disabilities and the institutional care. You know, the number of people who have been, unfortunately, they, they've died for one reason or another, possibly due to neglect. 
and 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 the whole media activity around that for the, now this big need for uh, a, a justice center. I mean, is this a knee-jerk reaction to uh, some reporter being opportunistic on a, a, a situation they stumbled into? Well, absolutely. It, it it certainly appears that it it definitely appears that it started out that way. It, um, it appears that some reporters from the New York Times upon getting information about irregularities in OPWDD and how they handled those type of abuse cases um, really created uh, an overreaction by the government in terms of wanting to um, replace directors and realign how these things are being investigated. But I really got to tell you, if, he was, if they were 100% serious about protecting all the vulnerable populations they say they are, They'd be also talking about people in nursing homes, and they're not. And they'd also be talking about disabled kids in school districts, and they're not. So I, I tend to think it's more of a media overreaction than an actual gen genuine policy shift. So uh, Angela, you know, a again, going back to you because of your particular relationship with the media, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 sensationalism sells story. Let's face it, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're probably seeing the, 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 the death tolls of the paper newspaper. Absolutely. You know, um, they ha somehow got to redefine themselves and if they want to sell papers or mm -hmm. via the internet, however they want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it. The broadcast media, you know, they want viewers now that everybody and their brother can have their own network. <laughs> Certainly the competition's out there, for, especially for the commercial dollars. So, mm -hmm. you know, would we not only see the sensational aspect of the, the great pity story or the, the great success story? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, with the just ridiculous amount of reality shows that are on right now, pretty much everybody in every special interest group now has one, whether you're rich, poor, a hoarder, or like the new one, um, Bush Girls, Bush girls yeah. yes, uh, features four women in wheelchairs. And really, other than the fact that they're in wheelchairs, there isn't a whole lot behind it other than the inspirational aspect of it. And that word gets overused to the point of absolute ridiculousness in the media and even directed toward myself, unfortunately. Um, when asked to do interviews or something, I can give an interview about any subject at all, and by the end of it, it comes down to inspirational and something about my disability, when my disability has nothing to do with the subject at hand. And you okay, made well, we're going to take a break here, and when we get back, I, I want to look at, at you know how are people with disabilities reacting to um, the, the fact of how the media is portraying them. So after the next 60 seconds, we'll be back and we'll further our discussion. Today, people with disabilities are participating fully in the social and economic life of New York State. In large measure, this is true because of the work of an independent living center in your community. The New York State Independent Living Council is dedicated to promoting the independent living philosophy and to facilitating access to independent living services. For more information on the Council or about your nearest independent living center, call toll-free 1-888-469-7452. Are you looking for new ideas to help you sell? Need a presentation that must compel? Have a message you wish to dispel? Or an important story you need to tell? Are you exploring new ways to communicate? to motivate, to educate, or demonstrate? Or are you searching for creative concepts to help you entertain, promote your brand name, to effectively train, or launch a new web domain name? Then focus on Creative Concept Studios and see the possibilities. Welcome back. We're talking about how the media portrays individuals with disabilities in the news media, on broadcast media, etc. And before I get into the question where I, I, I really like to explore the, the issue of how people with disabilities themselves are reacting to some of these uh, um, at the end of the spectrum of inspirational and tragic or whatever. Uh, Todd, you, you wanted a few words talking about the, 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 the print media as it goes towards electronic. It, it really, I, I'm, I'm kind of shocked that we, you know, we make this whole, whole argument that 
you know, that print media is moving electronic, so that this means there should be less of an opportunity to tell more detailed stories, when in fact there should be more opportunity because at that point there isn't the financial incentive for brevity that current newspapers have based on the scarcity of paper. A web article can be as long as it needs to be. A video piece that the Buffalo News or the Albany Sun might want to put on their web page can be as long as it needs to be. So you don't have to worry about the cost of ink, you don't have to worry about the distribution modes, the traffic, the, the exactly. new trucks you have to buy, all you got to worry about is paying the reporter. Exactly. Uh -huh. So uh, this kind of rides us a little harder about why they're not able to get into our issues in detail b based on the fact that they're still thinking print when they're publishing on the web. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And, and, and I am interested in, in, in hearing the fact that, you know, we, we've got representatives from the disability community here that, you know, Jim, when there's an inspirational story, mm -hmm. when they highlight that blind person, the person in a wheelchair, uh, the individual with Down syndrome, that they, they do this wonderful thing, they climb the mountain, they sw swim the English Channel, mm -hmm. they, you know, and, and they get all this attention and everybody feels really good about, you know, how is that impacting on persons with disabilities? Well, I think especially there's, there's an impact on two, two different degrees. Uh, one specifically is the use of language in print media. Um, there's a certain uh, genre, if you will, on how to respect a person with a disability. And that is not necessarily known by the people who are writing the articles or who are driving the story. Uh, the second being... What, what, do you mean, what do you mean there? I mean, give an example. Like the use of language. Uh, For example, as opposed to wheelchair bound, yes, as yes. opposed to someone in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a different kind of language that Being people so should crazy be using. As opposed to a person with a psychiatric disability. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh -huh. Definitely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the second point is, you know, when a story is told, there's a particular story that is available, and then because, as Todd mentioned earlier, because of whatever the situation may be in the day uh, that needs to be told in the local community, the story gets shrunk, uh, the story gets altered, and often rewritten by editors who may not know what the real deal is in the community. Yeah, and I, yeah I've also heard that, that, that the media are, has perpetuated the, 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 the stigma of a disability. I mean, what are we talking about there? I mean, if somebody has committed a crime or whatever, I mean, you know, it, it should be reported. It's not that somebody's committed a crime, right. it's that almost, it, these days, almost every uh, unplanned tragedy where somebody shoots somebody else, within 24 hours there's an article about how at the, in the past they were treated for a mental health diagnosis or it was reported they were off their medication or it was reported that this needed to happen or that needed to happen or just to make sure they're going to put them through an article 78 hearing and what that does is that perpetuates the stigma against people with mental illness because if you actually look at the statistics only two percent of the total number of people with mental illness in the united states commit a violent crime mm -hmm. and the statistics also indicate that the same people that they're reporting as dangerous are more likely to be victims of violent crime by people who don't have disabilities in the first place. Mm -hmm. But we never see that in the newspaper. We never see that on TV. So, Angela, you know, what can we see as the reason why uh, the reporter, so to speak, is, is, is missing these things. I mean, what's the problem? These people go to school, they're, they're taught how to write, they're supposedly taught to be on bias, of course, unless you belong to a certain network. Um, <laughs> you know, this is supposed to be instilled in these, quote, professionals in the media genre. You know, what's happening here? Well, of course it's supposed to be instilled, but how often is that actually followed? Um, as a person with a disability, naturally I write from the perspective of a person with a disability. So my language is going to be current with that of our community. However, if you have absolutely no context whatsoever and your editor throws a story at you, says, here's your deadline, get this done, you're not going to necessarily go through all the hoops necessary, look up the proper, you know, verb verbs and nouns and, and, and what we like to be called and not called and what you can say and not say and 
Instead, it's more of, let's get this out, let's get this done, and let's, let's pull an emotion. From a writer's yeah. standpoint, we The want article's got to grab. The piece, exactly. even on TV, the piece has got to grab you. The piece is to emotionally yes. invest you. That's so the, the words aren't learn. being used to engender our respect. Right. They're being used in a way to, to pull emotions out of other people. Mm -hmm. Now, people are going to say, well, they do that to everybody. I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. but I've seen stories with other people where they're portrayed as normal human beings, and there's this unusual thing about them. They wrote a book. They climbed Everest. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. We never I see that I think writing a book's a wonderful thing to do. I mean, <laughs> I've written a couple but, myself. You know, wh wh why, why not highlight that? Not everybody can write a book. Yeah, but we don't get highlight that way. Right. We don't get highlight because we did something special. Mm -hmm. We wrote a book. We did something unusual. We get highlighted because we did strange things like we went outside and went to school yes. in the morning. Yes. Um, you know, we so get So what you're saying is the heels. usual becomes the unusual for the disabled person. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, how does that impact in the type of work that you do as running an organization for people with disabilities, Jim? Well, specifically, it impacts, um, we do a lot of transition work. Uh, folks who have been incarcerated or folks who have been in trouble with the law in the past have transitioned back into the community. And one of the things that we are finding is that it becomes a deterrent when someone is coming back, paid their dues, and, and coming back into the community. It becomes a deterrent because the public is actually seeing them as not only the person with the disability, but also the one who committed a crime. And yes, they may have committed a crime at one point, but as everyone else in the community, you pay your dues and you're given another opportunity. And I know we're gonna take a break and when we come back in 60 seconds, I wanna look at how the entertainment aspect of the media is portraying persons with disabilities. So we'll see you in that minute. Today, people with disabilities are participating fully in the social and economic life of New York State. In large measure, this is true because of the work of an independent living center in your community. The New York State Independent Living Council is dedicated to promoting the independent living philosophy and to facilitating access to independent living services. For more information on the council or about your nearest independent living center, call toll-free 1-888-469-7400. Are you looking for new ideas to help you sell? Need a presentation that must compel? Have a message you wish to dispel? Or an important story you need to tell? Are you exploring new ways to communicate, to motivate, to educate or demonstrate? Or are you searching for creative concepts to help you entertain, promote your brand name, to effectively train, or launch a new web domain name? Then focus on Creative Concept Studios and see the possibilities. Welcome back. We're talking about how persons with disabilities are being portrayed in our media. And I, I, I'd like to take the discussion now into the entertainment network of uh, TV shows and movies and stuff like that. I mean, what are we seeing there? Are we, are we seeing adequate representation? I mean, I, I've seen very little TV, no. to tell you the truth. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, what I see seems pretty much right. You know, the blind person can't see and the guy in the wheelchair needs wheels. I mean, you know, <laughs> what else needs to come across? Well, the, the issue is that it's not actually a blind person. It's not actually a person in a wheelchair. They are actors and they are playing the role of someone who has that disability instead of someone with the disability itself being in that role. And this is represented where? Uh, a, a great example of that, uh, if you want to talk about people with visual impairments, is the USA Network show Covert Affairs. Mm -hmm. One of the, the three major characters on the show, he's a technical analyst and he's blind uh, and he uses technology to, you know, to, to, give all, to give the CIA type agency all the information they need. Mm -hmm. He's not actually blind, he's done media pieces where he's explained that he went to the mm -hmm. Canadian National Institute for the Blind and they showed him how to act blind. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. And of course, you know, the roles I do get are, of course, token wheeled girl in wheelchair roles. 
Um, they don't pick you to be a person who can walk across the stage. Uh -huh. Surprisingly, no. Yeah. <laughs> but I've even had problems where I was got the role, nailed it, and this actually happened recently. When it came time for filming, I ended up getting a call from my agent saying that they had replaced me with an able-bodied woman who would use a wheelchair because the filming location was not up to compliance and was not accessible. So they automatically excluded you? Absolutely, without even uh, creating provisions or anything else. And then, and then, for example, we have Glee, and I think oh, Glee is kind of the one. broadest example before mm -hmm. we, you move to movies. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, there's a disabled student, one of the members of the Glee Club in question, who's actually not disabled, and the, the national disability community had something to say about that, and there were some letters or communications to the production company and the Disability Coalition, the Screen Actors Guild had something to say. Yeah. And in response to that, rather than, than, than deal with employing more disabled actors, what we got were two things. One, they added a Down Syndrome high school student mm -hmm. who uh, was there for the plucky comic relief role, which kind of gets us back into that whole, you know, isn't that wonderful sort of thing. But then they did the, um, the spinal cord injured football player. And the, entire, the entirety of his role, which was a couple of episodes, was them seeing him trapped in bed at home, um, you know, wishing he could sing. And it's done a couple of times, and it disappears, and it's never talked about again. So rather than dealing with that problem about actually involving mm -hmm. real disability issues and portraying them accurately, okay, we're dealing with, well, we'll give them tokenism, and that'll shut them up, and that'll send them home. So you, you said about getting into movies. I mean, is this also prevalent within the movie genre? Sure. Let me give you one example. There was a movie many years ago called Scent of a Woman. Uh, Al Pacino star starred in that movie. Mm -hmm. He portrayed a man who was blind. Al Pacino is not blind. Well, that was many years ago. I mean, you know, have oh, no, it, no, it's happening today. If you're if you're mm -hmm. if you're out in the in the netosphere, talking to the netizens, you'll find out that they're currently netizens. Is, I just found out myself are people who what? Uh, citizens, citizens of, of the, the internet. internet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, my kids. Okay, absolutely. Mm. You'll find that there's currently a boycott right now of the movie Snow White and the Huntsman because the organization of little people in America are upset that the dwarves in Snow White and the Huntsman are played by um, regular size actors where they use camera tricks to make them appear to be persons of small okay. stature. Now, yes. is it better, and maybe you, this is a question I should ask you guys, but is it better that they do what the Wizard of Oz did back in 1936 or 38 or whenever they made that movie, where they had a number, obviously, of short statute individuals, but where they filled in the rest of the 1800 munchkins, they had children. Well, on one hand, at least they were employing some people of small stature mm -hmm. and showing them. But also, like you said, this was in 1937, 38. How far really have we come? This is 2012. We should be well beyond that now. We should be in the point where if we're talking about a movie based on Snow White and the Seven but, Dwarves, we should actually go to the people that have experience with that condition. Yeah. Well, next time we talk to the Wicked Witch, I'll see if we can do here, but... <laughs> <laughs> there are good witches. But the thing is, what are we... Oh, only in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> but, you know, what are we really... You, you know, well, who are we hurting? What are we doing? You know, what, what, what is it that we're saying that's so wrong because we have professional actors acting the parts of people if, with disabilities? They're actors. I mean, no, actor, they're, they're acting a role. No, but What's if we're, under, if but we're under the belief, Doug, that, that by doing this, we inspire people with disabilities to, or, mm -hmm. or show to us that we are part of regular society, they're doing the exact opposite. Exactly. They're telling us we're not good enough to, to ourselves. portray ourselves. We have to train people mm -hmm. that can do it better to figure out how to be us. Mm -hmm. We're not good enough. We have to train other people to play us. Exactly. And I know even wheelchair dancers and having, like we said, Glee, having someone who can sing and dance, I know people who are 
fabulous dancers. Ballroom, swing, salsa, Latin, all sorts of dancing, including modern. And they could have easily been employed in that role instead. And instead of that, we have a person pretending to be in a wheelchair and who now has to learn all the nuances of life in a chair and then how to dance in a chair when we have a fabulous group of people out there who already know these nuances, okay. who live it, and, it's not and about, who are looking for work. It's not about playing a role, it's about playing a person. And what you're doing is you're, play, you're playing the role of another human being that could very easily be played by the human being themselves. Mm -hmm. And just to wrap up, I mean, I want to make sure if we're talking about entertainment that we're not just talking about producers and casting directors. Mm -hmm. We are actually talking about writers Absolutely. who will forget aspects of disability rights law when it forwards the story. Uh, you watch Harry's Law, a show on NBC that recently got canceled. They had a story about um, a, a kid with a Tourette's-like condition that freaked out his school. Mm -hmm. They went through an entire court proceeding that wouldn't actually be allowed to occur yes. so that the judge could turn around and actually say, this is so creepy, she can be excluded from school. And on that note, we're going to have to end our particular show, unfortunately. But I guess the message here is that we've got a long way to go before we include, that we successfully include persons with disabilities, that we stop acting the part and realize that people with disabilities can be part of our community, even on television. So thank you for watching our show, and we'll see you at the next one. Points of View is presented by the New York State Independent Living Council, Incorporated, in cooperation with the Catskill Center for Independence, Finger Lakes Independent Center, Independent Living of Niagara County, and Western New York Independent Living. For the location of the Independent Living Center in your area, call toll-free 1-888 469 7452